Alice Taylor, and I'm a non-binary person, and I call myself a divine androgen. like saying that you're a monk or or a practitioner of magic or something like that. Maybe it depends on what path you walk. See, one of the things I noticed as I started to come out and started to identify as non-binary, I started to realize that there was no spiritual path for people like me. Like, I mean, there were some things like indigenous people, but I don't want to culturally appropriate. I didn't grow up on a reservation. And I think Two-Spirit is great, and I want them to keep it. And I felt like I had to define my own path. Because I didn't have a huge background in these things. And so I started to explore things. And, of course, some religions shame us, right? And then there's some religions that don't even include us. Like Wicca, I went to many rituals and... Never, not once, did they mention someone that was both or neither gender or god or goddess. Unless you asked, and then they would often have a goddess or something. But there was no language for it. And so as I started my own spiritual path, my own path of holistic learning, I learned that I really needed a spiritual path in order to be who I was. Like, I felt like it was part of humanity. It was part of being a human. And I needed to be celebrated in my spiritual path. I needed to be seen, and I didn't want any of the shame. So that's not for me. That's theirs. And so as I started to unfold, I started to realize that I had my own path, and each one of us actually do. You do. Everybody does. Has their own spiritual path that there to unlock your authenticity is in your heart just like it was in mine there were some things I had to go through to unlock those keys to get closer to who I really was inside because all of us are divine conscious beings and you have to work through some weird stuff sometimes like cultural norms and gender roles and gosh mental health and the crap your parents programmed in there sometimes we have to unfold that out and when we do we get to an authentic surface uh, authentic person when we move through those surface things and when we find our authenticity we can go deeper we can love deeper we can love ourselves deeper we can love other people deeper and we can enjoy our life fuller and more and feel more complete by the time it comes time to, you know, end. Because we all die. None of us get out of a lie. So, just consider, as you start to identify and find your gender is not something that was given. That is not something that was, a, you know, assigned to you when you were born. As you start to realize your gender expression, no matter what it is, I'm talking to the drag queens, the drag kings, the gay guys, transgender people, non-binary people, gender neutral people, all of us, we're all here for a reason. The divine sent us here. We're all here to define our own path, make it what it is. Follow that part of you that doesn't follow the rules, the part of you that doesn't do what other people are doing because that part of you will lead you to the path you need to be on and you will manifest the beautiful things that the world desperately needs all of us are we're, we need you we need you to step up and bring your most beautiful light to the world and I hope that that's what this book does that my book Divine Androgen A Sacred Path for Gender Variant People and this channel will inspire you to find out who you are and open it up to the world and deliver it as if we were all waiting for it but we didn't know what we were waiting for exactly show us what that is
Welcome to Rainbow Soul, an explorative discussion about spirituality beyond mainstream religions. Hollis Taylor, author, psychic, astrologer, and alchemical mage, brings their non-binary perspective together with fellow drag king and trans man, LaCrosse Ortiz, a Jewish Taino with spiritual background of exploration that has led him to an atheist perspective. Join these guys as they explore deep and difficult topics, all related to spirituality, offering a queer perspective, an exploration of interesting topics, and engaging guests to help explore conversations for the rainbow soul. Hey. hey we're like flipped <laughs> yeah that's unusual eh yeah hmm. oh my goodness yeah it might be because of stream yards up yeah or something so welcome everybody welcome to rainbow soul i'm hollis taylor and i am one of the hosts tonight for rainbow soul and i just want to first introduce rainbow who i am i am the author of divine androgen i'm a general all-around magician or magic person, um, Wicca and witchcraft and things like that. I'm pagan and I'm, you know, a psychic and astrologer and that kind of thing. And a general all-around freak, as I like to say. And <laughs> and this is... Yeah, no, this... <laughs> right. Hi, I'm LaCrosse Ortiz. Uh, I am Jewish, Taino, atheist. Jack, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. Um, I uh, I don't believe there has to be a divine to have a spiritual path. It's kind of irrelevant, and that's pretty much me. Fantastic. I'm so glad you're here, and I'm glad you're joining us. And today's, today's the first day of Hanukkah, so I just yes. want to honor that for a moment. Happy Thank Hanukkah you. to everyone around the world that happens to celebrate that. And um, tonight I'm super excited because one of the things that sometimes I encounter as a person that coaches and, and helps younger people that are also gender non-binary or gender non-conforming is that we get very, um, especially when we're traumatized, we get very like small world, right? It's, it's, it's what's happening in our neighborhood. What's happening in our school? What's happening maybe in our city, maybe in our state, but maybe even just our country. Um, but one of the things that I like to always point out is that the gender revolution that we're all in, that every single one of you gender variant people, including our allies out there, every single one of us, we're all, every single one of us, are part of the gender revolution and it's not just in your backyard. Right. It's around the world. It's everywhere. It's happening everywhere. Why is it happening everywhere? Because humans have to change. We have to change. That no matter what's happening, we have to we have to shift away from this binary thinking because it's gotten us into some trouble. So, uh, we and I believe um, now, of course, everyone can, t you know, choose to believe what you'd like to. Um, but I personally believe that this is written in the stars in the universe as an astrologer. And I believe that people, that the whole world is changing so that we can get away from the binary because the binary hurts men and women. And the only way that we would be able to make it fair for everyone, including intersex people, um, is if the binary wasn't a dominant thought way, uh, way of thinking. And um, instead, if people were able to think outside of that binary, that we could come to a more peaceful place as humans. So I don't know. What do you think? Do you think lacrosse? Do you think this is a worldwide move? Do you think it's like a, a, a divine calling? What do you think it? I, be I, I believe it's actually evolution. 
it's it's us evolving as human beings so some things you know as like when you look at some animals they evolved and some things they had to just they, they don't need it anymore we were technically had tails we didn't need it anymore i think this is just the binary is just another part of the evolution we don't need it anymore so it's it's as people are evolving you know you got those who are holding on to it for dear life and those you know those of us who are just like eh, we don't need this we're we, we're past this now and i think it is a revolution because a lot like you're talking millions of people are just no no more let's it's time for us to get evolve it's time for us to hit a higher plane right now so that's that's where i'm seeing it yeah i think we'll be better off uh without the binary for sure and so one of the when i'm looking around online to, just to by the way to our to our audience while i have your attention for just a moment if you're a non-binary person no matter what you're doing please contact me i may would love to have you on the show we're always looking for guests so I just wanted to send that out there. So that's what I was doing. I was online looking for guests. And, um, you know, you just search for non-binary transgender people. And when, now I have a couple of friends in Australia. Okay, I'm going to tell you, I do. Because I want to, like, it's like my biggest place of wonder that I've always wanted to go to. I have a friend that I constantly, that we had on the show before. Um, and the thing is, is that there's just something about it. So when I came across this next guest, not only are they from Australia, but they also do an awesome amount of work and beautiful activism. So I wanna bring out Nevo, Nevo, our guest. Welcome Nevo. Hello, oh, thank you so much for having me. Why don't you tell us a little bit of who you are? Sure, yeah, I would love to. Um, so my name is Navo I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nations uh, and would like to take a, a moment to send my respect to um, Aboriginal elders past and present as well as any First Nations people around the world who may be watching. Um, the land that I am on was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and also want to recognise as well the ongoing history of gender transcendence around the world for all of time immemorial, that it's certainly not a left-wing fad <laughs> or an, invent an invention of whiteness um, and that, you know, even some of the language that we use to speak around trans identity might not be culturally universal. Um, so I want to recognise that. Um, so, yeah, I live um, in so-called Australia, in um, Nam or Melbourne, I am an author. I've written a couple of books. I've got I've got them here. Actually, I got my housemates to run and grab them for me um, in time. So uh, my first book is called Finding Nevo um, or Finding Nevo. I have a uh, Nemo tattoo as a fun fact. Um, and it's a memoir about my experiences of growing up as a trans and Jewish young person, um, what it was like coming out in a small Jewish community within Melbourne, um, and it's got like a glossary and some learning tools and stuff in there as well. Uh, and so that came out in 2017 when I was 21. Uh, and this book came out this year. It's called The Pronoun Lowdown. Um, this is available all over the world. And it's a guidebook on all things pronouns related, a bit about gender around the world, um, how different gendered languages are reckoning with gender neutral language, um, a bit about like the English history of they, them pronouns as a singular um, yeah, some timelines of trans history, a bit about my story as well. So it's just kind of a mishmash of a lot of different things. Uh, and then I guess outside of my writing space, so I, I write young adult um, poetry. Uh, I run writing workshops for young people as well, for trans and gender diverse young people on how to, how to write and um, how to express themselves and find their voices and the, their stories. And then outside of that space, I run educational workshops in schools and workplaces around trans identity and do professional development on how to not be a jerk and how to respect people in their entirety. Um, and I'm also a marriage celebrant, so I do that as well. Um, and I really like negotiating through those spaces of, I guess, like theory, but also spirituality and, and embodiment and what our relationships are like to our gender beyond um, just being relative to binaries or just being um, 
adversaries or um, oppositional, but rather like what does the divinity of our relationships to ourselves and um, our full selves and, and our spirit look like. Uh, and that's something, yeah, I really resonated with what you said earlier, Hollis, around like, I think that we are part of a gender revolution and I also think that we are here for a reason and I think our existence not just gives permission to gender transcendent people to explore that but also gives permission to cis people to understand that there are so many different facets of themselves and that we have been coerced into these gender cages and when you spend your lifetime shaving down parts of yourself in order to fit into those boxes of course it makes you angry to see people existing outside of them. Why should they get more freedom than you should? And that's exactly the question. Why should we get more freedom? Well, we don't. You can also have that freedom. You just have to join that invitation rather than um, see it as, as something against you. So that's a little bit about me. It seems to me that um, often people that are really against it actually have some sort of internal um, thing going on. Most of our most of our um, audience are uh, non-binary or queer people, um, or allies at the very least. I would uh, I would assume. <laughs> um, but I mean, the thing is, is that that I really am interested in your uh, pronoun lowdown book, um, and I was like, wow, like like just thinking about that part of it that that our pronouns have like that there's a history. And the history to gender variance, to gender, uh, you had a different word for it, similar, but not the same. Um, yeah. Anyway, so gender variance is, is, you know, it's just the expanse, all of it, all the different ways it comes, gender fluid. And, and I think that it's fascinating to remind us that it's been in our history, that this is not a new thing. This has been around for a long time. Yeah, I think that erasure and invisibilizing of our trans history is not accidental. I think it's a very um, conscious process of erasing us from the planet. And I think that it was done significantly through colonization. And obviously that has um, disproportionately impacted First Nations people and their own cultural connections more than it has myself as a settler on stolen land. But simultaneously, you know, even looking at Jewish ancestral connections and some of our holy scriptures, like we have about six or seven different genders represented within our culture. Um, and that's not something that you get taught of when you're learning for your bar or bat mitzvah or, you know, when you're learning the Torah or anything like that. And I, I think that that's on purpose, you know, it's the same with all LGBTIQA plus history, like, oh, those two women that lived together and loved each other and shared all of their assets, they were just roommates, you know, like, I think that um, we we take this, this cis heteronormative and often very white lens to history because of the ways in which we hi like create a hierarchy of history um, and that the victors are often the ones who are writing down history um, in their favour. And so... I think that we take that lens and then we reappropriate what history looks like through it. Um, and once there, you know, I, I really loved what you said, Lacrosse, about how we are evolving. And I think that that is very much true and also that we are remembering. I don't think that we are moving to like a new transcendent space necessarily. I think we are returning um, to where we were and to um, what's what humanity has always spoken to, which is that expanse, you know, and that opportunity and that abundance. Um, so I think that that's been a very violent and active uh, process. And I think we are starting to untether ourselves from that. It's definitely like a, a huge shift to that what we're going through. I don't know how long the gender revolution has been going on um, there in Australia. But here, it's been going on for a while, you know, and if you count drag, it's been going on for a really long time. Um, but like all, there's recently some big shifts, you know, recently uh, gay people can get married in the United States. But, but our awareness of, um, of that our land is on, that we live on stolen land is very small, um, mm -hmm. that we don't. Uh, we have talked about it on this show. We've had numerous indigenous people of um, native uh, from America, from this North America, but we 
in general, as an American culture, we, we haven't gotten there. Like we just, there's no awareness of that. Uh, very little indigenous people don't really have their rights at all here. Go yeah. ahead, lacrosse. <clears throat> yeah, I was, I was going to say, I, I don't know if it's a, I don't know if it's, it's lag, it's, it's chosen ignorance, you know, I think at this point of, of how the indigenous people, how we are all treated. It's, it's a chosen ignorance. Um, like even within what's going on in Puerto Rico, uh, now they're acknowledging the indigenous people, but only up to a certain degree. And when at the end of the day, it has to do with giving back land or money. No, 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 no. It's not a happening thing. So it's, it's, you know, follow the gold. You'll follow the one who's, who's behind it all. And as long as they can keep people in chosen ignorance, I think it's, it's, it's going to continue. It yeah, won't last absolutely. long though. It won't last long because I mean, people are getting tired and they are starting, you know, well, not starting. It's been a long time of a fight, but they're going to continue fighting. Your mute's on. <laughs> um, you know about Standing Rock, Neva. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I really thought Standing Rock would change um, would change the way Americans seen it, but uh, it hasn't. So um, if the gender revolution, the gender revolution though seems to be full steam ahead in America. Um, there are definitely people that are against it, but that group is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. So what is it like there in Australia in that regard? Yeah, I think it's an interesting question. You know, like, I guess um, I can only really speak to my own spheres and what I have observed in the spaces that I exist in. And I move in pretty um, activist grassroots you know, leftist circles. So we are all very conscious of the land on which we live and pay the rent um, as much as we possibly can or, or as much as we are prepared to at this point in our um, journeys to elders and to community members. And um, there is a lot of conversation around those sorts of things. And I think what's really important as well is like renegotiating um, some of these revolutions that we are on, like the feminist revolution or the gender expansive revolution or, um, you know, anti-racism revolutions and recognizing that none of the success of any of those movements can exist without First Nations sovereignty and self-determination. Um, the same with environmentalism, right? Like we're not going to tackle climate change. We're not listening to the caretakers of the land who have been caretaking for tens of thousands of years, if not longer. Um, so I think that those issues are often very siloed. Um, and I think, you know, as we've seen, like feminism is incredibly whitewashed and so is gender revolutions as well. So many of the trans and gender diverse people who are um, making headlines and who are really front and center are often white, slim, able-bodied, upper middle class, um, have access to transition so they can quite easily pass if they so choose. Like there is still a standard of beauty around what kind of gender transcendence we will accept. Um, and I think that that has been really prevalent in a lot of those movements is like your proximity to privilege um, will get you much closer to rights. And rather than aligning with the most marginalized in our communities, we align with the powerful elite because we think that if we can assimilate them, we will be afforded those rights. And many of us have experienced that kind of assimilation throughout our lives. You know, Jews have certainly um, done that, especially Ashkenazi Jews, you know, in certain places in the world are very much considered white and have access to a lot of privilege, which historically we very much weren't. So I can see that play out a lot um, in so-called Australia. And I think that we really need to consider what it means to stand in solidarity with the most marginalized of communities and that if we liberate the most marginalized, then all of us will be liberated. Um, but if we keep trying to prove like, we're just like you, don't be afraid of us, you know, which happened a lot here in the marriage equality debate. It was very much like two, you know, upper middle class white men being like, don't be afraid of us. We're just like you. We want a white picket fence and 2.5 kids and a dog. Like we're not scary. We're not trying to threaten you at all. And that's all well and good. But I, 
I do want to threaten you. I do want to threaten your way of living. I do want to disrupt this entire system. So what does that mean for someone like me? And I also have quite a proximity to that privilege anyway. So what does it mean for even more marginalised people? You know, my disabled friends, my First Nations friends, my black friends, like what does that actually look like? Um, so I see that playing out a lot and I think as, as soon as we sort of stop siloing those issues and understand the true intersectionality of those spaces, um, we can reach that sort of revolution um, in more solidarity and create more of an interdependence of movements as well because I think part of this independent approach of like we're going to get this issue done and then we'll move on to another one or something I think has a really individualistic almost capitalist approach um, is also informed by white supremacy and toxic masculinity of like we'll get this done and we'll do it in this way and um, you know so many of the environmental movements that I see even in so-called Australia are led by white people and aren't actually considering considering like the racial implications of climate disaster um, similar to transphobia, you know, the transphobia that I experience comes from a very different place than the transphobia that my Aboriginal brother boys and sister girls, um, friends and family and people that I'm connected with, they experience, you know, because not only have, are they experiencing that transphobia, but it is laced with white supremacy and with colonialism. And um, yeah, I think that there's a lot there that still needs to be explored. But I do think that as far as like trans and gender diversity goes, I mean, there's a lot of, um, flow on effects from what happens in the US and on Turtle Island to what happens here. Like we're very privy to what goes on for you, even if you're not always privy to what goes on in the rest of the world. Um, but we, you know, like Elliot Page and Demi Lovato and Jonathan Van Ness and Sam Smith and like all of these sorts of things happening is, is quite huge for me having come out in 2013 and just to see the development like almost in that exact time frame you know like 2014 was the year where time magazine called it the transgender tipping point so i think we have all felt that in a similar timeline um at least by my perception yeah um i am aware of america's influence on the world um yeah it's um it's, it sometimes worries me greatly um and um also at the same time um, I'm glad that we are doing some things in, here in America that clearly like when we had, um, when we had, uh, when we talked about Stonewall, um, and we, we had a friend on, she is connected with people in Africa that are being murdered and put in camps because they're queer. So, um, you know, when you recognize what's happening in the world, that there are, gender variant people all over the world um, and we're all going through our own thing and, and we're privileged to live in a country that at least uh, is not actively hunting us and trying to kill us and put us in camps. Although I do want to say that, you know, especially with Day of Remembrance just passing, is that, that there were tons of murders, especially of trans people of color um, here in the United States that's Gr grossly disgusting the fact that we're just now starting to count um and it's uh it's it's a troubling thing but what's more troubling to me is not just that but the fact that people that are gender gender variant are killing themselves that the suicide rate is so high now when i when i first came out and now i'm 46 years old so when I first came out, I, I didn't even know I was non-binary. I had to get there. I had to go through all this other stuff of thinking I was a lesbian and a dyke. And I guess I am. But I'm also these other things. And it took some time to get there. And I'm feeling really like I feel like the young the the younger generation, your generation, millennials and younger have been blessed with the choice beyond what like lacrosse and I were presented with. We just, it just wasn't, it was like something so hidden deep in the closets that we had to go personally digging in the closet to find it. 
we had to get all the shit out of the way. And then, oh, at the bottom of the closet is this whole gender movement. And I think like at our age, we started to put it on and say, whoa, maybe this is bigger than I thought and dancing with drag queens and realizing that we um, that we matter and that we're something. And then the younger generation just coming out and going, yeah, I'm non-binary at 20. We're like, gosh, I wish I knew that at 20. And, and to some degree, that's, that's beautiful privilege. That, yeah, totally. That we as human beings, that we actually, um, we, we build on the shoulders of our ancestors. Thank God. We do that. And I, I, was about to say, I, I was about to say, as being the proud parent of a millennial, which I am so proud, I love my daughter, um, I, and come and transitioning in such an older age. And I always go to this quote that I that I've list I have remembered since I was in my twenties, and it says, "You can only take people as far as you have gone yourself." Mm-hmm. And the beauty of that saying is, is that when I looked at my daughter and I. I looked at her and said, question authority, even if it's mine, fight for what's right, fight for this and fight for that, because you know what, nobody's going to hand you anything and you have to go out there and you have to go for it. And to see this generation blossom and where, where people are complaining and I'm like, what are you talking about? We're the ones who raised them and we're the ones telling them fight and they actually have the courage to fight and now there's resentment for it. And then they're fighting and things didn't get bad, done until they actually started stepping up and fighting, which to me, it's just so beautiful. But it goes back to that quote. I took my daughter as far as I could go. Not only did she go that far, but she surpassed me and is continuing to go and seeing this young generation taking climate change serious, taking you know the racism and all this social injustice seriously. This is probably one of the most beautiful eras to ever live in. You know, I just think it's amazing. So kudos, I'll tell you, kudos to you for your work. <laughs> it's yeah, amazing. I think, I think that's a really, really beautiful quote. And I love that, especially in so much of the work that I do and, and my partner works in anti-racism as well. And the conversations we have around, like, we're not getting people to the finishing line. We're getting people to the starting point. That is like our job and it's their job for however far they're going to take it from there and so that really resonates with me and yeah I have I have so many thoughts um coming to my mind from what both of you have said but I really loved Hollis what you spoke to about how we are you know off the backs of our ancestors and I think about that a lot of like the the life cycle of activism right and that it's not like social media in which you get instant gratification it's like planting seeds of trees that you will never sow and fruit that you will never bear um, for future generations but that we are also constantly eating the fruit of our ancestors past and that you know we didn't just get to um pronouns and the gender revolution and whatever because it's 2021 like wake up people we got here because our ancestors died in the trenches fighting for this and you know i really want to honor both of your experiences as well in in sifting through all of that shit in the closet because it meant that there was much less for the rest of us to search through um and it's so interesting as well because my experience in a way, like I'm sure there are so many differences, um, but even with what you were speaking to, Hollis, I was like, that was also my experience. Like I resonate more with that even than I do people who are 15, which is so interesting. Like I think just showing that timeline of how much things have shifted um, is significant because I also, you know, I came out as a lesbian and again, I did it much earlier in my life probably I was 15 when I came out as a lesbian and um, was questioning my sexuality and then I was 17 when I came out as trans but I didn't have any of that language available to me I didn't have any representation of trans masculinity I had Chaz Bono and like Buck Angel were probably the only things that I had and they're not like the best representations in my personal opinion um maybe Chaz is fine but Buck's got some real stuff to work through uh I certainly didn't know that non-binary people existed you know like I was so privileged to have the internet and not to find, you know, an encyclopedia at the back of a library, for example, but I was still, there was no one in Australia that I could 
go to there was no one that I knew I was on YouTube finding like yeah American you know one year on testosterone videos and um, messaging whoever I could and when I did eventually come out as trans the only connection I had to someone else was like someone at school that I kind of vaguely knew had a friend whose brother had transitioned and then we met up and he like gave me so much knowledge and wisdom but I didn't know what surgeons were available. I didn't know what testosterone processes looked like in Australia. I didn't have any of that. And now, you know, there's like Transgender Victoria. There are trans hubs. There are like gender clinics everywhere. There are resources everywhere. Like, you know, and that was very much what I seek to do in writing my books and in who I present myself as to the world is like to be the person that I didn't have growing up, you know, and I have so many young people, like when I go into schools, like what it means for them to see a non-binary person paid by their school. So like substantiated in some legitimacy, come and talk about my life and, and my experiences. Um, you know, I have young people messaging me on Instagram saying like seeing you every day on my feed makes me feel like I can make it to adulthood and like the significance of that. And then, you know, at the same time, I think, while all of that is very much true, I think what we are experiencing is a transition from invisibility to hypervisibility, which then presents so many new issues that none of us really dealt with in our growing ups. You know, like when we went through the marriage equality debate, like one of the main Australian newspapers wrote the equivalent over that period of 90,000 words just against trans and gender diverse young people. Now they weren't getting married <laughs> they weren't involved in marriage equality even it was just like the trans agenda and it wasn't researched it wasn't fun like it wasn't substantiated and they were able to do that and there was a 40 percent increase of access to mental health services by young people during that time and in 2017 which is the same year that marriage equality was legalized here there was a um, survey done of trans and gender diverse young people under the age of 25 here. And it was the first of its kind that was qualitative and quantitative. And they found similar to what you were speaking to, Hollis, of uh, one in two trans and gender diverse young people had attempted suicide, a 48.1% statistic. Um, there was, you know, 80% who had ever self-harmed. There were huge rates of anxiety and depression compared to the general population. And we knew all of that, of course, but to see those numbers was so stark and of course those are uh, statistics but they're also our friends you know and our family and our community like I've been on suicide watch for friends of, our, of mine since I was 17 and I don't have the resources I don't have the mental health training like I didn't know what I was doing at 17 years old to try and help and keep my friends alive and that's not something that every community faces you know and again that disproportionately impacts disabled communities and First Nations communities and people of colour in very different ways. But I do think that that is something that we often share is like this mutual aid and mental health support and community care that we offer one another. So I think it's a really interesting concurrent experience where we are, younger generations do have so much privilege and then also are experiencing this whole kind of column of cons that some of us didn't really go through. And you know, the other thing that you were speaking to lacrosse, which really resonated for me around like people getting pissed off at younger generations being so like switched on or revolutionary. Um, I see that with like older queer people sometimes where they're like, oh, you didn't have it anywhere near as bad as I did. And you have so much privilege and you really need to like appreciate that and check yourself. And it's like, that's not incidental. You fought for that. Like it's because of you that they're experiencing that. And, and that's a good thing. Like, that's what you want. But I think because of the trauma that so many of us hold and because we struggle sometimes to extract our identity from a narrative of suffering because it has been so intricately and intimately involved, I think it's quite confronting for us to see young people who do just get to enjoy their life. And will we be able to see, you know, gay people and trans and gender diverse young people who haven't experienced dysphoria or who haven't been you know not accepted by their family will that activate some of our traumas and our triggers and will we do we actually want the thing that we fought for you know and I think that is a question of like how do we reckon with that how do we sit with that and how do we make young people and marginalized people resilient and aware of like their history while also not having to suffer themselves which is a big question 
Yeah. And thinking about young people, like immediately what comes to mind is uh, a five-year-old that I know that came out when they were four, three, four years old, I guess um, he's now seven. But when he was younger, he had to tell his mom that he wasn't a girl and that he was a boy. And um, that's been a, a fascinating sort of friendship that I've had, sort of mentorship um, with the family is not only the, the mother's experience where she feels like her daughter died and she gave birth to a son um, and this child is five years old telling us and he's corrected me if I ever use they pronouns on them, on him, he tells me that it's he. And um, so and even though we've had the conversation that I am both, um, and, and I use they pronouns and he's like, that's fine, but I'm a he, you know? And so that's very interesting to me for a five-year-old to be like that. And for his mom to allow him to live like that mm. and for her to be taking him to transgender camps and things like that. Like you just, like, I wonder what he's going to be like when he's 20. Mm. I'm kind of excited to see. Now, yeah. some, some oh, of your kids are not that young, right? Like, I mean, your one child is 10? Yeah, my youngest is 10, but they it goes all the way up to 33. So <laughs> I got the Brady Bunch, remember? <laughs> but <clears throat> no, I think it's uh, it'd be great to not hear have to deal with the coming out story. Um, it, it would be so beautiful. Like in, in my home, it's just my son will come up. I'm pansexual. Okay. All right. There you go. That was the whole extent of the conversation, all of 2.5 seconds. And it's whatever. Actually, the biggest story was my son was straight. I have one son who's straight. Well, yeah, that's what I'd be much more concerned about. Is right. And and it, I'm worried about that. Yeah. And he came out and I, I would keep, and me, I wanted to be such a positive parent. And I'm like, look, if you're pansexual, are you asexual? Are you this or that? Or you, you know, I'm trying to be that parent. And he finally gets in touch with his sister. And he's like, look, mom, mom has to understand I'm straight. So I ended up with like this reverse coming out story where my son ended yeah. up straight. And I was Look, like, it could just be a phase. There's no <laughs> right. I was like, no, that's that's on your father's side. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you didn't get that from me. You know, yeah, but I mean, it would just be such a beautiful place where these children can come out and it's just, it doesn't even have, nobody has straight stories. You know, No, mm. nobody comes out and says, oh, mom, I got to talk to you, I'm straight. Mm. Nobody has that, like, It'll be a beautiful day when we don't have to have those either. We could yeah, just exist. I think, I think it's going to be fascinating to see the way that things evolve in the next even five to ten years. Because, for example, something I was thinking about recently, which actually blew my mind, is that my friend, um, Dr. Carl Myers, who, who lives in the U.S., and they've written a book um, called Raising Them, and it's all about their journey with gender, creative parenting, and raising their child without a gender, um, or, or with all genders, rather. So they used they, them pronouns for him until he was about five, and then he came out, so to speak, and said, I really love he, him pronouns, I'm a boy, um, and that's great. And so they've written a book about it. It's really beautiful. But something I was thinking the other day as I was reading this book and I was sort of marinating in it and I was like, I don't know whether this child is cisgender or transgender because I don't know what, because they weren't assigned anything at birth. I don't know what his genitals look like because why would I? <laughs> and that those definitions are entirely reliant upon what you were assigned at birth. Right. So what will it mean in the future when we don't assign gender at birth? Will there just cease to be transgender and cisgender categories? Will that be a false dichotomy at some point down the line? Like it actually boggled my mind because I was like, right, that is entirely reliant upon what your parents have kind of projected onto you. And if they don't do that projection, then I guess you're just a boy, a girl or non-binary and that there will be you know, boys with different genitals and girls with different genitals and non-binary people with different genitals. And that's just kind of how it will be. And that was like, wow, fascinating. That would be amazing. <laughs> I thought about that as well. And I've thought about how there will be no gay. There will be no need to be gay, you know, um, because 
that would crumble. It, to be gay means to have two men together or two women together, right? Mm. To be lesbian. So uh, I thought about that. And part of me was like, I kind of like gay bars. Wait a minute. <laughs> and I, wait a minute. I like drag. And so I kind of understood what some binary people, um, I've had women, um, when I say that the binary needs to fall, um, I've had women say, wait a minute, that would mean that I wouldn't be a, a woman. Mm -hmm. And um, to them, to these feminist women that I know, to them, that that's that feels like losing a part of who they are, and maybe that also would be the same for me if you know if I couldn't say that identify it as queer. I don't know who my family would be, um, and I might feel a little alone too. But but at the end, uh, when we think about depleting um, like sexual assault and things like that. Um, because just to, by the way, in case you didn't know this, if the gender binary goes away, uh, there, most psychiatrists and stuff are pretty sure that sexual assault will take a huge dive because most sexual assault is driven. We prove it with the statistics that is driven uh, by gender. Most of the time it's women or transgender people that are raped. Um, and so just want to say that that by having by doing away with the binary that we would also um do away with sexual assault and almost anyone can get on board with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> and especially like social structures and support right because a lot of it is also from poverty from you know uh so many different uh situations that create those those disparities within our societies and i think that question around you know obliterating gender is a really interesting one because i've definitely come up against that as well with cisgender people and also with binary trans people and i guess for me like my end goal is not to obliterate gender or for gender you know when people are like gender is fake my gender is not fake like my gender is very real i have many genders i'm bursting at the seams with gender you know like sure some people are agender and that's completely valid but that's not my experience and so i don't want us all to be wearing sort of gray shapeless sacks and living in androgyny and sort of brave new world vibes like i want autonomy i want self-determination i want all of us to be able to live all of our genders as completely and fully as possible. And it comes back to that conversation of what I was saying earlier of extracting our identity from a narrative of suffering. Like, I believe that without oppression, we can still be queer and trans and gay and whatever language feels good for us. And I'm sure there will just be more and newer words and words that are more relevant and how we find our communities and how we find that our families and our spaces, I think those things will continue to exist, but they probably won't be from a tragic side of things or, you know, and I think that like trans people for the most part have been pivoting away from that tragedy narrative, from that born in the wrong body, born a girl, became a boy kind of language, which, you know, if that resonates to you is totally valid. But for me, I don't ever really feel like I was born in the wrong body. I always feel like the wrong categories were placed onto the body that I had. And so you know, I think that we have started to pivot from these tragic trans narratives around dysphoria to euphoria, you know, and I often tell trans people you don't need to experience dysphoria in order to be trans, but I wonder if you've experienced gender euphoria for a gender presentation that is different from what you've been assigned and what that experience looks like. And when we literally just like move our head from one direction to the other, and that's the kind of narrative that we're embracing, that it's like, not when did you know you were different, but when did you find love? Or, you know, those kinds of conversations. When, not when did you feel uncomfortable in your body, but when did you feel safe in it? When did you feel seen in it? You know, those conversations. I think that we can still have so many of the beautiful elements that we have nowadays without having to have all of the negatives. And I think it's a conversation of how do we maintain that? How do we stand in solidarity with other marginalised communities if we haven't experienced marginalisation ourselves? How are we cognizant of social injustice if we're not part of those, you know, marginalised spaces? How do we um, embrace the privilege that we are afforded while also redistributing it? Like, I think there are a lot of important conversations there. If we shy away from too much, we're not reckoning with the reality of it. And I think we've seen that a lot in gay men, you know, that their history is like not that long ago of experiencing 
immense disadvantage and um and oppression and you know the AIDS epidemic and the reason why we lost so many of our seniors and our intergenerational relationships but still you see so many gay men enacting misogyny taking up lots of space you know being horrible people um not you know creating space for other marginalized people and so I think we already see that playing out um and I think there are a lot of conversations around that that we can have to ensure that that doesn't happen but that we can still maintain those familial and beautiful autonomous um environments yeah um I'm definitely excited to see what happens in the future as some of these things fall away and as a witness to what has happened what has happened Mm -hmm. is that you know gay bars, uh, I think we talked about this with Rusty Rose, um, because she was part of the Stonewall movement, is that, like, gay bars were separate. When you went into a gay bar, it was this way was the women and this way was the men. And they were completely different. And I remember the meld of the two. I remember when more transgender people started to show up. I remember when um, drag became more common. Um, And when drag changed, I think even lacrosse, we've witnessed that um, being from the same drag family. When drag went from you, if you are, if you have uh, breasts and ovaries, you dress like a guy. And if you have testicles, you wear a dress. Yeah. Um, and that was drag. And now <laughs> um, I would say our drag brother, um, uh, Mr. Treats, um, really showed all of us um, how how you can really take gender and bend it in a way that you're like, wow, I just never even imagined to see a bearded person with holy eyebrows <laughs> and eyelashes out to here and a dress and now our drag well she's your drag mother lacrosse uh whitley yeah. where does that so yeah. like just the amazing part of watching these things change just in the last i don't know 20 years maybe yeah. that we've watched that change it's completely changed it's completely different than what it was Yeah, I mean, I even get that with regard to like the subversive gender categories because, you know, I was assigned female at birth, I transitioned when I was 18, I then discovered my non-binary identity and have through that really come to reckon with and heal a lot of the feminine parts of myself and I am more feminine now than I've ever been in my life and I wear dresses and I wear makeup and I wear heels sometimes and that feels really powerful for me. I've really found like the very mothering energy inside of me and how my matrilineal line, you know, speaks through me quite a lot and that I'm more connected with that at this point in my life than my patrilineal line. And um, it's funny because people on my Instagram sometimes, you know, when I put something like, here's a photo of me eight years ago with my testosterone script or whatever. They're like, oh, I thought you were trans femme. Like, whoa. And I'm like, it's an interesting conversation around like positionality and privilege. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about trans misogyny and the experiences that trans feminine people go through that I don't encounter. But simultaneously, I do encounter misplaced trans misogyny. You know, if I go out on the street wearing a dress, like, People don't know what I was assigned at birth. They make an assumption that I am um, AMAB and that I am dressed in a certain way. And so that is an experience that I, I do have, whether it's misplaced or not. And then also people on my Instagram basically saying, I thought you had this genitals or I thought you were this kind of non-binary. And that's the, the way that we also project this same binary onto non-binary people. It's like, yes, I am trans mask. Yes, I am willing to talk about that and speak to that experience I'm also incredibly feminine and what does it mean when we talk about these AFAB AMAB categories or trans femme trans mass categories and we don't consider that some people don't look like also what you expect in those categories and also what you have created of your own mind and I responded to that person and I was like I know you think that this is like an okay thing to say but it isn't this isn't a guessing game this isn't like a fun let's figure out what this person was assigned because that is just as transphobic as like any other incarnation of that. It definitely is. Go, LaCrosse. 
I, I, I was going to say, I appreciate the, the statement you said, and I definitely resonated with that, with the wrong category. There was no mistake when I was born, just the wrong category. Um, and I totally identify with the, like, I have always grew up with four brothers, ultra Latino masculine, the, the, the worst, Mis misogyny at its best. But it wasn't until I transitioned that I could sit there and embrace any type of femininity with myself because it was so self-hating, it was self-loathing and literally took a lot of healing. And I think that that is something that I've been seeing big within the trans community is there's so much hatred of their past, who they were and no, no space for compassion and love for that part of themselves mm. and realizing that that person got you here to where you are and mm. it's just and and also with the whole thing the guessing game you know a lot of people were like that's their first question oh i would have never guessed you were trans <laughs> i would have never guessed well bro oh thank you i i must be doing a good job i don't you know what? Yeah, i'm not trying to convince you <laughs> who would have thought that my presentation actually has nothing to do with you i don't right. care what you think exactly all i know is i am hot and if you are attracted We're to me you are gay <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but like I said, but I think that's also with a lot of healing that has to happen in the trans community because yeah. I've seen so many trans men go so misogynistic and I'm like, we're supposed to be the, you know, I, I tease and I always, I've said this a hundred times. I can say, I love Marvel. I'm the next X-Men. I am an X-Men. I am the next evolved man. How can I be an evolved man? If I'm acting like those, like that, the, your typical cis male who treats women like like they're objects and 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 all that way, like, and so here comes the hurt. What in you, as a trans individual, causes you to hate yourself that much? Dysphoria is one thing; self hatred is another. Totally, and there is so much toxicity to that, and I resonate with that so much, and I can see it in in particularly in binary trans people, which I think is part of the reason why a lot of my friends aren't. Like a lot of my friends are non-binary and gender fluid because I feel somewhat trapped sometimes by the ways that people embody their own genders. And I, I know that's fraught and, you know, their story is their own. But um, I felt that so much in my coming out, you know, like someone who was assigned female at birth, learning to hate women because I lived in a misogynist society and I internalized so much of that misogyny and I hated myself and I tried to shrink myself down and be quieter, which is also a really interesting conversation around Jewish femininity because Jewish women are not quiet and our version you stay of behind the mechitza. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's very different, right? Like I come from a long line of very powerful, loud women. And so even my version of womanhood looked very different to Anglo women as well. And so, you know, I was trying to shrink myself, which was both, both a process of internalized misogyny and assimilation. Um, and then, you know, when I transitioned and I thought that I was a man, you know, I also then hated myself because by then I was in feminist spaces and I hated men and... I suddenly couldn't take up space in the ways that I had as a feminist because it wasn't subversive anymore and it was just reinforcement of the mainstream. And, you know, I just got to this point where I looked in the mirror and I was like, when do I stop hating myself? Like, what do I have to do to stop hating myself? Because I have been through so much now. I'm over it. I don't want a checkbox of what I need to do to be a woman. I don't want a checkbox of what I need to do to be a man. Who am I when I'm not relative to these categories and I'm relative only to myself or to the wind, to the river, to the birds, to the mosses, to the fungi? Like, who is that person? Who is the person who walks in the forest when no one else is around, you know? And, like, reckoning with that. And I had never identified with the, like, dead name kind of language or, you know, born in the wrong body, or I never wanted to, I'd done too much therapy to speak about myself in ways that would, you know, cauterize parts of myself or compartmentalize parts of myself. And I think that there is this expectation that trans people, you know, do that. We separate ourselves from our past self. We, you know, sometimes mark our birthday based off when we started hormones. And, 
my, I, I'm not, you know, eight years old. I'm 26. Like, I'm not, I don't wish to rewrite that history. I don't wish to start over. And, you know, when I got chest surgery, um, I went to the same hospital that I was born in. And people, cis people mostly were like, wow, that's so beautiful. It's like a rebirth. And at the time I was like, I don't want to be reborn. I have been born. I am working on myself every day. I'm 19. I don't want to start again, you know. And so for me, such a really big part of my healing has been reckoning with myself at each of my ages, at each of my incarnations that all exist in me at every moment because sometimes they are triggered or sometimes their memories come up. Like I cannot separate myself from the little girl that I was once or the trans boy that I was once or the, you know, the gender free little toddler that I was, you know, like all of those people exist inside of me, their voices are inside of me. And I really felt that when I was writing my first book, my memoir, because I would write something from the perspective of 21 year old me and be like, you know, well, she didn't know who she was. And that's not actually, you know, her experience. And I could hear 13 year old me be like, no, I'm a woman. I feel pretty certain about that. Don't speak about me that way. And I was like, oh, okay, true. Um, and at the very end of my book, the, the afterword, I actually wrote a scene of a party that I go to with myself at different ages and the conversations that we may have had and how we would have connected. And, there, you know, writing this book was so traumatising, but it was also so deeply healing because I was just able to extend so much love and empathy for all of my inner children, for how they had brought me to who I am now, for how much of them are true in me right now. Like, I think I have more in common with 13-year-old straight woman version of me, straight cisgender woman version of me in the ways that I present my gender now than I do with, like, my fragile masculine trans man version. You know, like, that, there are so many different elements of those people that are activated in me, and, and I love all of them. And I just don't think that you can hate yourself into loving yourself, you know. That's what society wants. That's what they want from us, um, you know. And that's, that's my story. Like, that's not for me to project onto anyone else. People can have their own processes. But I really resonate with that lacrosse of that healing that still deeply needs to happen in our trans communities and the pathologized language that we have been ascribed and, you know, what access we have to our own stories and, and all of ourselves, um, and that there is a lot of deep psychological, emotional, and spiritual healing that needs to happen in that process. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my, my gender, my gender identity, I say is, uh, is non-binary or an androgen, andro, um, because I feel that my experience as a woman which I've done a lot of things as a woman. I was a wife. I was a mother. I was a. Uh, I was even a prostitute. I was a. I was a professional uh, dominatrix. You know, I really empowered myself with femininity. What I discovered in that experience of feminine empowerment was that I wasn't just feminine that I was also masculine and I totally embraced that right when I became a drag king because I totally you know people totally used male pronouns with me and no one questioned it really at all and um being a drag king was very empowering and I had a similar experience of you know like having to come to terms with that I'm all there and for me synthetic hormones are not they're not they don't work in my body so i can't take them if i want to um and i could maybe have surgery and i'm thinking about it but to me i don't feel that my body is the problem in fact that's my message in my book and in everything i've ever written and done my message is that we are all sacred beings that we were put here for a reason. This is why we're here. And um, to erase the fact that you were born, even if you are a man, and to erase the fact that you are a woman um, is, uh, I feel like it erases part of who you are. And, you know, it's just, I guess it's a matter of experience. The three of us clearly agree on this. 
<laughs> um, and we have to take a little break and we'll come. I just want to let you guys know that dream, if you have a dream, um, you can totally put it in the chat and uh, we would lacrosse will be happy to interpret it and I'll be back. We'll be back to finish up on the show tonight. Thanks for watching rainbow soul and we'll be right back. Go get yourself a drink. <laughs> Support rainbow soul. Check out the Rainbow Soul merchandise for your favorite new shirt. A variety of colors and styles to suit your taste. Show off your love for Rainbow Soul. Get cool designs with your favorite quotes. Designs come in a variety of colors so that you can express your most authentic self. Support Rainbow Soul in spreading the word that queer, gender variant, intersex, transgender is sacred. Rainbow Soul, putting the soul back into queer. Order your unique Rainbow Soul merchandise at rainbowsoul.show. Jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. So what exactly does that mean? It is a figure of speech in reference to a person who has dabbled in many things rather than gaining expertise by only focusing on one. So much knowledge and wisdom out there at our fingertips, yet so difficult to grasp. Everything and everyone has a little piece of the truth, and it is up to us to determine what our truth is. In this busy world, creating the time, the space to nourish our bodies, mind, and soul has become a difficult task. So let's take a moment to learn something, something small, in whatever way the universe decides to reveal it. It could be someone's story, a quote, a spiritual practice, maybe a song or a movie. The opportunities are limitless and all around us if we just take a moment to see. We are all students of life experiences. So let us learn from one another. There is no right or wrong path. There is only your path and your journey. So let's begin our adventure and explore all the world has to offer. And let us become a master of none. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. Hey, look, we'll cracked open a new Pepsi. <laughs> I was, it's okay. Drink your Pepsi. It's okay. So. I was going to ask you, I don't know if anyone put up a dream. I oh, think someone Sandy, just, Sandy did. just did. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Sandy said, I had a dream about four days ago, but it was so intense. I remember every detail as if it was yesterday and it's pretty <laughs> in depth. So I'll just maybe save it for another time. Okay. Oh, okay. All Actually, right, Sandy. I, I wanted to ask you. Oh, I was say, do you have a dream? Cause I had a dream. <laughs> you have a dream. I have a dream. That you're going to interpret for us? No, maybe someone else can interpret this time. I, I'll, I'll, I can try. <laughs> okay. Depends. Um, basically, it started off, I was on a journey. I went to Philly and I went to meet a family member of mine and her children. And I packed everybody in my house. Mind you, I have six kids and other kids and all that. And we got in one little car, went to Philly. We get to Philly and we visit, blah, blah, blah. She's like, oh, could you take, you know, my nephew and niece home with her two kids? So we plop all of them into the car. And so we have all these people in the car. And then I'm about to get in the car and this kid screams at me, your car's a piece of shit, you know? And I'm like, well, at least I have a car, you know? And then I get in the car and I drive, the car breaks down. I said, oh shit, what am I gonna do? So I get a bike long bike and everybody's on the bike and I'm riding the bike and the bike breaks. Then I start going through this bad area and this lady starts yelling at me. How could you bring children here? What you're, you're a pedophile that you would bring children here. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And you know, and I got in her face and it's everybody started coming at me. I said, no, I'll take anything, but don't, don't say things like about that and the kids. So I end up leading everybody and we get into this little dark corner and I get stuck. And everybody's, everybody just looks at me like, well, where are we going to go? I said, well, I got nothing. 
I, I don't know where we're going to go. And everybody just left. And I was left there alone. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> so the first, so what happened is I just listen intently and see what comes to mind. And I feel like um, what immediately came to mind was, are you, cons are, have you considered what you might be like as an empty nester? Oh yeah. I'm always considering that. <laughs> okay. I'm just wondering if your, if your mind is processing that for you, uh, that that could actually like you like a full house, you like having everyone there and, what happens when all these kids grow up and go on to live their life. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's a little bit of like the dark corner thing um, that you suddenly are like, I have nothing. And it felt like you had nothing because no one was there. Mm. And uh, so I was just wondering if it has something, to, a lot of people experience that, especially if you grew up in a family with a lot of people and then you have kids and then finally, when you get to a certain age, parent everybody moves out and you're on your own and you can feel like you have nothing. Mm. Mm. So just, just a be. thought that yeah. maybe you might want to consider that maybe you're experiencing some fear around, um, around that. Yeah. Around empty nesting, um, which is no joke. It's a real thing. Empty yeah. Nesting no, is I've heard thing. about it. I definitely heard about it. I haven't experienced it, but I've heard about it. Yeah, I've experienced <laughs> it. Um, as an experienced person, I would say that um, you have to really then become hyper-focused on yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and since I had a kid when I was 17, that was challenging for me. Um, right. But I, but I, it, it wasn't that hard. I, I spent a lot of time praying and doing yoga Um studying things and yeah. my life became very full i'll just reassure you you can fill your life up with something else so <laughs> so <laughs> that's that would be my interpretation if anyone else has anything you guys can put it in the chat if you want since we're flipping everything around today <laughs> Is there something in the stars? <laughs> there must be something in the stars to flip everything. Yeah, well, Venus is in retrograde. Oh, okay, so, there you go. Uh, that probably has a lot to do with it. And, you know, we are speaking, we are, we do have this wonderful guest from Australia who's down under, right? And so that feels flipped because, yeah. you know, it's like 12 o'clock in the afternoon there or something. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> and here it's like, you know, eight o'clock at night. So anyway, as we finish up the show, I just want to bring Nevo back, back on. Welcome back, Nevo. Welcome. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> so as we finish up, I'm so glad that you have come on and, you know, just shared with us what it's like for you and what it, what's going on in your side of the world. And um, I appreciate your ability to talk about it. I think you're an excellent speaker, by the way. Yes. I can see why you do that kind of thing. And um, I would, I'm would i really looking forward to your books. So can you tell us about your books again? Sure, yeah. And I just want to say as well, you know, thank you so much for, for having me and for both sharing your souls so generously as well as, as someone who hasn't met either of you before. You know, it's been really beautiful to be able to hold this space. And so often I'm interviewed often by cis people, you know, and it's like a really obvious, um, there's just not reciprocity. Like it's very clear that it's like me extending my vulnerability and them extending their curiosity. <laughs> um, and so it's been really nice to share in this space in a way that has felt really mutual and, and beautiful. So thank you for that. Um, so my books, so the first one, Finding Navo, um, it should be available to get online, but it's not in bookshops in the US um, as far as I'm aware, but um, potentially you could ask them to get it in and who knows, maybe if there's enough demand for it, it might get picked up there. That would be awesome. Um, so this is my memoir that came out in 2017 and um, you can read that little passage of me meeting myself at different ages at a party, um, which I, I really enjoy that, that part. And then the pronoun lowdown should be at bookshops, hopefully. I know it's definitely at Barnes & Noble and a few other big places, but if you're able to go to local bookshops and, and request it in, that is definitely 
my preference and obviously not to get from Amazon is a preference as well unless, you know, for whatever reason you can't access it in other ways. But I would recommend libraries before Amazon um, and libraries are a great place to enjoy books and it's, yeah, super colourful. There's some information about me. Um, it's like light and accessible, hopefully, and a good talking point for a few different um, ideas and timelines and yeah, all sorts of things. So I hope that you um, have a little look. And if you're looking for recommendations of other things to read, I have like lists in here of things that I recommend. Um, so there's like books, TV shows, children and YA, um, lots of different spaces to go if you'd like to, to learn more or be more immersed in the conversation. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about them. And, and feel free to get in touch with me. I'm on social media. I'm contactable. You can find me on Instagram, Nervosism. Um, and I do a lot of training workshops also internationally as well. So if that's something that is interesting to anyone, feel free to get in touch through my website. And, um, yeah, I'd be happy to organize some stuff. I'm really hoping that as, you know, the pandemic um, – evolves into a different phase that I might be able to actually make it to Turtle Island. Um, I would love to do some events there and, and connect with people. I haven't had a chance to be in that space either. And, and Hollis, if you find yourself on this side of the world, please hit me up. I can introduce you to lots of drag kings and some cool places to perform. Hey, I'll be there someday. Like, I <laughs> awesome. am determined. I will. I have wanted to go to Australia since I was a very small child. It's a good time. I'm biased, but I really like it out here. <laughs> Fantastic. I actually hope to have um, retreats in um, all over the world um, for non-binary people someday um, okay. where they get to explore themselves. I am, I am resourced. I am a mental health person. So, um, and I'm hoping to have retreats. And I have a person that owns a retreat center in Australia. And, cool. Whereabouts is it? Do you know? Um, it's on, I know it's on the north northeast coast. I've looked at okay, it on cool. the map, and I can't remember the In name. Queensland. It's near, but it's of course mm. isolated. It's out. Um, it's cool. not. It's not. She has a beach, and then if you go way way inland, uh, apparently you can see some kangaroos. So cool. she, because when I was a child, I had this obsession with kangaroos and going to. Australia and so now she likes to we met in Hawaii and so she she sends me messages of <laughs> she sends me like videos of the kangaroos and she's like <laughs> thinking of you love you you know Cute. Um, the yeah so uh she's a very good friend and I hope to be able to have a retreat at her at her place sometime Beautiful. So if I do that, I would hire someone like you. Please let me know or I'll yeah. just come in attendance. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm hoping that um, to, to do this after, you know, this pandemic thing is going. So one of the things that I do that is hard to find is a non-binary tarot reader. And here I am. So uh, this deck is a love is love deck. It's a pride deck. I'm going to do a reading for everybody right here, right now. If you're watching this, if you're listening, this reading is for you. And this deck is 100% queer. And each card is made by a different LGBTQ um, artist. And the first card that I pulled is this. This is the card of choices. This is the card of black and white. When things seem like black and white, like you have to go this way or that way, right or left. And they also can be sort of opposite of each other and fighting, right? So that's what this is all about. And this is referring to our past and the choices that we've made. Whatever those choices are, just know that they were choices. And that's all they were. And your choices can change and things can shift as you go forward. Because this card right here reminds us and you can see there, this is a, a rather gender neutral person relaxing with their dog. And you can see the swords up here, which are the good thoughts or the things they see good about themselves. And this one down here, they've kind of tossed it aside 
as if it's not important, but it actually is. And that's exactly what we were talking about today. When we were talking about throwing a piece of yourself out, you are perfectly valid just the way you are. However, your gender comes out today, tomorrow, yesterday, and last week. And in fact, that's what this is for. So your choices are what they were, and that's okay that you made those choices. And however you're feeling today is also valid. So that's what this that's what this is all about. This is about honoring your choices and that all the pieces of you are valid. And that as we go future into the as we step forward into our future, this is the nine of swords. I think I've only had this card one other time, and I do readings all the time. Um, and you can see there's like an image of what looks like to be a feminine figure there in a dress or something in the woods. Um, but it's a nine of swords, which makes me think about thoughts. And this is like, remember who you are. Remember who we all are. Because your experience as a gender variant person, whatever that is, is sacred. And in fact, it's valid. And remembering where we came from and where we're going and knowing where we're going and visioning where we're going, because that's what this is all about. It's about planting a vision and moving forward to it and remembering where we are. So that's what this is all about. That's what this reading is. It's about your choices that you made, how they may have changed over time and how you may have thrown a piece of yourself away. Those things are not valid. Are, are completely valid. All parts of us are valid. And hold on to all parts of yourself. Hold on to the, all the parts of you that is you. And keep your vision going forward. You are sacred. You are valid. And so is your journey. So that's what I'm here to tell you. That's, that's the message of the cards today. And I'm so grateful to be able to do that for all of you. And I'm so grateful for, for this show and you, Lacrosse. Oh, thank you. No, thank you for always tolerating me every week. <laughs> oh, come on now. I think you're an, an, a great person. I appreciate oh, your perspective. Thank I you. I appreciate that you do this with me every week. And Nevo, I so appreciate you taking your time today to do this and talk to us and just help spread the word that you are valid and sacred just the way you are. It was an honor and a privilege honor and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing the work that you are. And I hope that we can connect in the in real life space at some point. Hey, oh. maybe sometime we'll go swimming in the ocean together. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. And good night, my friends. Good night. Thank you for watching Rainbow Soul, a queer perspective on spirituality beyond religion. We appreciate you sharing the show on your timeline, follow us on social media of your choice, and join our Facebook group, Rainbow Soul. We want to hear from you. Share your topic ideas for Hollis and Lacrosse. Explore upcoming shows and interesting guests. The Rainbow Soul Facebook group, where we build community of questioning seekers. Rainbow Soul, where spirituality is our medicine. Divine Androgen, a sacred path for gender variant people. A book dedicated to every drag performer, transgender person, and other gender variant people that have passed to the other side, that have suffered the wrath of our binary world. Thank you for living your truth and treading us a path. We are sorry that in many cases that cost you your life. Now, we ask for your assistance in helping humans evolve so that we may all live in peace and equality. We honor your life by walking our own personal path of authenticity. Get this amazing book all about living as a non-binary person, a gender variant person in a binary world, how to navigate it, 
how to harvest your true self when you're surrounded by binary. It's a guidebook for people searching for their true selves. The book is intended for people that are gender variant and can be helpful for people searching for a more authentic self or clearing trauma. This book is about treading your own path. It includes my story in the beginning, all about how I figured out how I express gender and now how it comes out for me, how I discovered it and how I dealt in the world as a response to that. And it also details out the ways that I unfolded myself in a way that helped me live in a binary world, even though I was non-binary. There are steps in here to help you define your own path. Hollis uses the word divine androgen. It's like a label to define someone that defines their own authentic path, regardless of their gender expression, in a way to say that it is sacred to be non-binary, to be transgender, to be queer. It is sacred, not religious. No, no, we're talking about more of a spiritual, conscious awareness of ourselves and our path on authenticity. This book is about defining your path of authenticity, as authentic and unique as that is for you. You can also order the book at divineandrogen.com.